Scripture reading for today is in the book of Exodus. I'll be reading from Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 through 27. If you'd like to follow along, there are Bibles under the seats in front of you. Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 through 27. God's word for his people. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. And they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them, and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and wilt give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. And they came to Elim, where were twelve wells of water and threescore and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. Amen. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. May he bless our hearts with a deeper understanding of it. Amen. missionary moment for today comes to us from the Independent Board for Presbyterian Foreign Missions, and it relates to the Rendilli Outreach. In fact, it's quite a long uh, request today. Judith and Peter praise God for bringing the Rendilli Outreach through many troubles and victories in 2017. Now, I know some of you probably get Judith's uh, (coughs) prayer letter on your email, so you know there's a lot more than even this little short paragraph that we have here today. But they want to uh, trust him now for 2018. May he be pleased to grant them relief from troubles, peace, and the fruits of the Spirit, to help them to complete recording the eight-hour Rendilli SD card for evangelism in the North. You know, they pass out these little SD cards that have scripture and many other things on them. Starting this school term, Kenya has a new school curriculum at both primary and secondary levels. Thank God for private schools being given freedom not only to choose their religious stance, but also to be protected from any other faith or lifestyle claiming freedom to choose the heads from available lists. May the the government pays for the heads in the deputy and gives the school its right to choose the heads. May the Christian ones 
they have chosen from the available list for the Ba'ala school be happy in the new culture and the hardship area that they find themselves in, that they may adapt well, keep healthy, and be a blessing to the children. So quite a bit of prayer requests there. So let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the work of Judith Collins and Peter Lacayo and Lucy Lacayo. Father, we thank you for the uh, outreach that they have, and we pray especially for the development and the recording of this SD card in the Rindili language, because that way they can hand it to people and leave something behind that will give them in-depth and intense training and teaching. And so, Father, we commit that to you. We pray that that would take place very rapidly and that the cards would be distributed very quickly for their inexpensive and easy to distribute to people who most of them have devices upon which they can play these cards. Father, we also pray for uh, continued peace and safety from the troubles that have been brought by various individuals within the government, and especially the pressure that has been brought on the Christian community by the Muslims. We pray, Father, that they might have truly excellent uh, heads of school and uh, that they might have excellent assistance to them and that the teachers would be communicating the true gospel of Christ. We thank you, Father, for this apparent breakthrough in freedom, and we do pray for your continued blessing upon it. We pray, Father, for the children also, that they would be saved, that they would grow in the grace and in the knowledge and wisdom and love and obedience of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that you might give encouragement to Peter and to Judith, and we pray that uh, they might continue to strong stand in the faith. And Father, we pray for your blessings upon this church here, that you might, by your grace, enable each one of us to stand strong in the faith, that you might enable each one of us to walk by faith and to walk in the power of your Holy Spirit and to the glory of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, for those in the listening audience out over the internet, that you might direct their thoughts, too, to the Word of God, that you might cause them to trust Christ, to walk in the power of your Spirit and to the glory of God. Father, we pray that you might demonstrate yourself strong on our behalf, that you might cause this church to grow, that you might bring people here who would love the Lord Jesus Christ and serve him with all of their hearts. We pray, Father, for those of us who are here, that you might teach us to be obedient to the word of God, <clears throat> that you might cause us to confess our sins, knowing that you are faithful and just, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And today in particular, Father, we pray that you might cause each one of us to come with clean hands and clean hearts as we come to the Lord's table. Father, we thank you that you have given us this memorial of our Lord Jesus Christ to remember his death on Calvary's cross, a death for our sins, according to the scriptures, his burial, his resurrection from the dead. We thank you, Father, for that. And yet, because Christ died for our sins, we do not want to come to this table with that which is evil in our hearts, our minds, our spirits, our lips, our bodies. Father, we pray that you might even now, as we stand before you, confessing our sins, cleanse us from those sins. We pray, Father, for those in authority over us, that we might lead quiet and peaceable lives in godliness and honesty. We pray for our leaders. We pray for their salvation, for the salvation of their families, for their spiritual growth for their testimony for Christ, for their willingness to stand for the truth of the gospel and be unashamed. We pray, Father, for the peace of Jerusalem. You have great promises for those who love that city, the city of the great King, our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that you might cause each one of us to day by day live with expectancy, with anticipation of the imminent return of Christ, that our lives might reflect the fact that we know that Jesus could come back at any moment. Father, we pray now for your blessing upon this service of worship, that our hearts would be humble before you, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth, for you have declared that you seek such to worship you. And so, Father, we pray that you will accept our worship in Jesus' name. Amen. As our ushers are coming forward this morning to receive our morning gifts and offerings, we're once again reminded of the great truth of the gospel. But salvation is a free gift from God. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy that he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. If you have never experienced the new birth, if you've never 
received in your spirit the washing of regeneration. If you've never trusted Jesus alone for your salvation, you're trusting something else. And either you are trusting him or you aren't trusting him. There are only two options. Are you trusting Jesus alone to save you? If you are, you're saved. It will make a difference in your life. But the issue is, are you trusting Christ alone for your salvation? The Christ of scriptures, the Christ who died for your sins, who was buried, who rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You understand that he's both God and man, and he came to save you. If you're trusting anything else, even partially, you're not saved. But if you trust Jesus alone, he gives you the gift of eternal life. It's a gift. You can't buy it at this offering time. This is merely a reflection of the love of God's people that they have in their hearts for Jesus Christ. And so as you come today, you come, I trust, as a believer, giving back out of love a portion of that which he has given to you. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of giving because it is indeed a response of love. We love you because you first loved us. And Father, we give because love always gives. And so Father, we commit these things to you in the name of Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. In Jesus' name, amen.
things come of their own and of thine own Please remain standing and take your hymnals and turn to number 344, certainly a great hymn to sing on Communion Sunday, Grace Greater Than Our Sin, 344. seated. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of scripture that we read just a few moments ago over in the book of Exodus. We are in Exodus chapter 15 looking at verses 22 through 27. Exodus chapter 15 verses 22 through 27. Now last week we continued looking at the ten times that the Jews rebelled against God in their wilderness wanderings. Rebellion test one was rebellion against God's ordained leadership, and of course they failed that multiple times, but that was the first test, and they failed it over and over and over and over again. Rebellion test two was bitterness and anger instead of faith at Mara, and we discovered that there were some important principles from the bitter experience of Israel at Mara. First, God designs pain in our lives to cause us to trust him, to take our eyes off temporal things of earth. Second, suffering comes before blessing, and pain comes before joy. Third, the third principle we learned was that the walk of faith is essential to a productive, joyful Christian life. The fourth principle that we learned was that walking by faith is required for heavenly rewards. The fifth principle that we learned from Mara was that failure to walk by faith is counted as rebellion in the eyes of God. The sixth principle we learned at Mara is that every category of faith testing that any believer, that includes me and that includes you, every test that we ever face, that type of test is found in Hebrews chapter 11 where we have the heroes of faith who overcame each one of those tests and walked by faith. They tell us how to respond to those particular types of tests. 
The seventh thing that we learned was that if you refuse to walk by faith, it's impossible to please God. It's impossible. And the subheading under that, we saw two principles. When you refuse to walk by faith, there are at least two results. Number one, your premature death. That's serious, folks. That's what happened to Israel. Everyone that was age 20 and over who wandered through the wilderness died in the wilderness. Your premature death. Second, your loss of heavenly rewards. That's nothing to be sneezed at. That's a really serious issue. And you'll learn that someday when you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. So summary. Failure number one, rebellion against God's ordained leadership is rebellion against God. Failure two, refusing to walk by faith is rebellion against God. And remember, walking by faith is a habitual lifestyle. It's not an occasional sporadic New Year's resolution to do better. It's a habitual lifestyle. We saw that there in the application, there are three takeaway lessons from the rebellion at Mara. Number one, having a bitter spirit is rebellion against God because it blames him for doing evil when he meant it for good. Number two, refusal to walk by faith and refusal to walk in the spirit is rebellion against God. Third takeaway lesson, refusal to accept the tests and disciplines of God is rebellion against God. Now, I want to add some new material here today. We had actually gotten farther than this, but this is a very important thing to add at this point. I want to add some important material since we finished our overview of walking by faith. And I'm going to entitle this subsection, Fear is the Opposite of Faith. Fear is the Opposite of Faith. This is very important because we discover Israel always fails to walk by faith in all of the tests. That's an underlying principle. So what was it that made them refuse to walk by faith? And it was fear. Now, we see the contrast between faith and fear very clearly set out in Psalm chapter 56, verses 3 and 4. And folks, I encourage you to memorize these two verses because every one of us faces a test of fear versus faith every day. Are we going to be afraid? How many of you had even just a little inkling of fear this past week of something might happen that you were hoping wouldn't happen, like your car wouldn't start, for example, oh, no, I'm going to have to walk. That happened to me this week. I think my uh, neutral safety switch on the ignition is going out again, and I thought, oh, no, yeah, I am way far away from home. <laughs> I was like three miles from here, and the car wouldn't start, two miles. And uh, praise God, it started. And so, you know, I, I had two more places that I had to stop, I left the car running with the door locked. I had another key. <laughs> Just so I'd make sure that I got back home. How many of you had even a little bit of inkling of worried about something or fearful something? Yeah, everybody did. Come on, you know you did. Everybody raises their hand. Not everybody. All right, well, let me read you the verses. Here's the contrast. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. What's the opposite of fear here? Trust. What's trust? Trust is faith. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In God I will praise his word. In God have I put my trust. I will not fear. Now listen to the next part. What flesh can do unto me. David's writing in the context of his enemies. If you read all of Psalm 56, David's writing in the context of his enemies who are his adversaries and some of them have been deceitful and they've pretended to be his friends and he says, you know, I'm going to relax. I can trust God. When you're afraid, that's what you need to do. Fear is the opposite of faith. It's more than that. Fear is the tool of the devil, and he almost always uses it to get you to rebel against God. That is one of the underlying factors behind rebellion. He uses fear to get you to rebel against God in many areas of life, but especially in refusing to walk by faith in obedience to the word of God. You say, I know the Bible says that, but I just can't do that. You ask yourself, why did you say you just can't do that? It's because you're afraid of consequences. If I obey the Bible here, if I witness at work, I'm going to get reprimanded. If I put up a Bible verse in my cubicle, I'm going to get reprimanded. If I have a Bible on my desk, I'm going to get reprimanded. Or I might lose my job! You know, in the military, 
there was a military personnel that had a Bible verse up on the desk and got court-martialed. And that case is still working its way through the courts. They wouldn't take it down because they believed they had the freedom to express in their own personal space. They weren't even out on the base passing out tracts. Their faith in Christ. People, that's the society we live in. And you know that there's a push by those who hate God to try to eliminate all vestiges of the presence of God from all public space and eventually come in and take over the private spaces of the churches and close them down because they do not want to hear about God. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Our little kids memorized that verse many, many, many years ago. In God I will praise his word. In God have I put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. That's the devil's tool, fear is. But you know, God never gives you fear that leads to disobedience. There is a fear that God gives you, but there's never fear that leads to disobedience. God never gives that. Listen to what Paul says, 2 Timothy 1.7. For God hath not given us the spirit of of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. Fear, phobos. You know, you've heard of phobias, that comes from the Greek word phobos. That's the word translated fear here. God has not given us the spirit of phobos, not given us the spirit of fear. Instead, he's given us power, love, sound mind. Did you know fear destroys all three of those. Fear destroys power. Suddenly you become weak. You're terrified. Your knees begin to shake. You see the enemy coming. You don't know what to do. Somebody just says something. Makes you tremble. Fear destroys power. Fear destroys love. Your life will lose its love because you are afraid. Suddenly, something else motivates you. Love motivates you to courage. Love motivates you to sacrifice. How many men have gone to defend our country and they moved forward in the face of death because they had loved ones at home, a wife, children, father, mother, brothers, sisters, family. Fear destroys love. Love motivates you to courage. Fear destroys a sound mind. You don't think clearly. Fear makes you act irrationally. Fear drives you to stupidity. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God gives you stability. Fear gives you instability. Fear causes you to do things that if you actually sought, sat down and thought about them, you'd realize that's really stupid. I don't think I'll do that. But it's sudden. It's instantaneous. Suddenly, the attack comes, and you run. There's also an important reason why we are not to fear, contrasted with faith. Here's the reason not to fear. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man bringeth a snare. But, and here's the contrast with faith, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. The fear of man brings a snare, but whoso puts his trust in the Lord is going to be safe. You see, the Bible contrasts fear and faith over and over and over again. There's also a contrast in Scripture, and you find it many, many, many times. 
a contrast between the fear of man and the fear of the Lord. We are supposed to have the fear of the Lord. We are not supposed to have the fear of man. Listen to what the scripture says about the fear of the Lord and how this is a blessing to have the fear of the Lord. I'll just read you a few of them. Lots and lots and lots of them. But wherefore now, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord our God. No respect of persons are taking of gifts. Let the fear of the Lord be upon you. That's the first command. Second Chronicles 19, 9. And he charged them, saying, Thus shall you do in the fear of the Lord faithfully and with a perfect heart. When you have the fear of the Lord, it empowers you to do things faithfully. You see, when we understand who God is, that he's holy, he's righteous, he doesn't take bribes, we can't twist it and say, well, God, you know, we really sort of thought you meant this. When we understand who he is and that he is holy, it causes us to be faithful in what we're doing. Not lackadaisical, not slothful, but we do it with a perfect heart. Perfect doesn't mean sinless, because none of us are sinless. Perfect means complete. We do the entire job. We don't leave it half done, not half baked. With the mature heart that goes the distance. Listen to Job 28, 28. And unto man he said, Behold the fear of the Lord. That is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. The fear of the Lord will keep you from doing that which is evil. Psalm 19, 9. The fear of the Lord is clean. Enduring forever, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Psalm 34, 11, Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. David taught that to his sons. Psalm 111, 10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and good understanding have all they that do his commandments. His praise endureth forever. Did you know Solomon, one of his sons, Remember that and wrote it also in the book of Proverbs. David's writing it in Psalm 111, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We find that Solomon learned that too. The fear of the Lord, this Proverbs 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Verse 29, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. 2, 5, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Chapter 7, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way and the forward mouth do I hate. Chapter 9, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. That's a fantastic verse. It's one of my Old Testament life verses. I have three of them. That's one of them. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the holy is understanding. That's what David said in Psalm 111. 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Solomon repeats it here. Chapter 9, verse 10 in Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Does it do anything for you? How about chapter 10, verse 27? The fear of the Lord prolongeth days. You live longer if you have the fear of the Lord. But the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Ah, there's something that cuts into your lifespan when you commit sin. Chapter 14, verse 26, the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. His children shall have a place of refuge. Remember we talked about the difference between faith and fear? Faith gives you courage. Fear makes you tremble and run. It gives you strong confidence. The fear of the Lord is strong confidence. His children shall have a place of refuge. Chapter 14, verse 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Ha, it does give you life. To depart from the snares of death. How about Proverbs 15, 16. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. And most of us focus on what kind of junk can we amass here on earth. The fear of the Lord without all of that stuff is more valuable than not having it, having great treasure and trouble therewith. 
The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. That's part of wisdom. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. By the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Chapter 19, the fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that hath it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. Chapter 22, verse 4, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Chapter 23, verse 17, Let not thine heart envy sinners, but be thou in the fear of the Lord all the day long. You think David and Solomon had a few things to say about the fear of the Lord? They certainly did. How about the prophets? How about Isaiah, chapter 11? Verse 2, Speaking of Christ prophetically, he is our example. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge, now listen to it, and of the fear of the Lord. That's a prophecy about the Messiah. Verse 3, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. How about chapter 33, verse 6? And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Do you want stability in these times? Do you? Do you want strength along with your salvation? I know you're saved. You've trusted Christ. You're on your way to heaven. But do you want strength with that? Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. You say, okay, show me something in the New Testament. All right, Acts chapter 9. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Samaria. This is after after Saul was doing his thing. And were edified. Now, what were they doing? It tells you. And walking in the fear of of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Folks, we want this church to grow. How many of you here want this church to grow? Anybody doesn't want this church to grow? All right. How did the churches of Judea, Galilee, and Samaria grow? Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. There's nothing here about techniques. There's nothing here about big bands on the stage and strobe lights and wiggling bodies. But there is something about church growth. It tells you the nature of the people who composed the churches. Walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. These are people who are walking in the Spirit. That's what it's talking about when it says walking in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. They're walking in the Spirit. We saw walking in the Spirit parallels with walking by faith. The fear of the Lord. Walking by faith. That's how God makes his church grow. And when it doesn't, it tells us something about the church. The devil can make a church grow, the flesh can make a church grow, but it's not church growth according to Scripture. Walking in the Spirit, walking by faith, walking in the fear of the Lord. They were multiplied. Now, in contrast to all of that, God commands us not to be afraid of people and the circumstances of life, because God is with us. You know, that phrase, fear not, occurs 62 times in the Bible. Let me just give you a few of these promises. And listen to who the people are to whom these promises are given, and you'll see a whole bunch of people who are in the list of the heroes of faith. Okay, here's Abram. This is before he got the name Abraham. Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. And these things, the word of the Lord, came unto Abram in a vision. Now, who is the word of the Lord? Anybody? Jesus. There's the pre-incarnate Christ. You know, that is his title all the way through Scripture. We find 
that the book of Hebrews tells us that Christ spoke to Abraham. Well, here's one of the occasions. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, <laughs> here we have the words, Fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Now, Abraham had a lot more things to be afraid of than you and I do, <laughs> including running around in a desert where there are all kinds of poisonous snakes and scorpions and all kinds of bad guys out there trying to kill people. Uh, you and I don't have anywhere near the kind of things that Abram had to be afraid of. How about chapter 21, verse 17? Here we find Hagar, who's just been driven out by Sarah. And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God came, called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Even to Hagar. And because he was a child of Abram, God said, I'm going to give him great national status too. Many princes are going to come out of him. And because of Abraham's sin, that's the reason, one of the bottom reasons for the Arab-Israeli conflict today. Genesis 26, 24. The Lord appeared unto him in the night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Here's Isaac. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. Don't be afraid. You're not the first generation. Don't be afraid. My covenant still goes on to you. Fear not. I'm with you. I'll bless you. I'll multiply your seed because I made a promise. Chapter 46, verse 3. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for there, for I will there make of thee a great nation. Fear not. Deuteronomy 121, Behold, the Lord thy God has set the land before thee. Here we have the promises of God through Moses that, look, quit being afraid. We're going to talk about this later when we're talking about the tests that God gave. But Moses is saying to Israel, he says, Behold, the Lord God has set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of thy fathers has said unto thee, Fear not, neither be discouraged. Oh, fear brings discouragement, doesn't it? You're afraid, man, I'm never going to be able to get this done. And you get all discouraged. I had a, a, a sort of a smattering of that this past week. <clears throat> I was in the process of digging a great, big, huge, deep, long trench to put electrical conduit in since the conduit that used to or the wire that used to run from the garage uh, over to the house or back again uh, it had been tacked underneath that ramp that was there which has now been removed and so here we have an exposed wire it's an indoor outdoor wire it can stand the outside but <clears throat> it's supposed to be buried and they didn't do it when they built the ramp so I'm digging this big 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 trench two feet deep and you know it really is tough dirt underneath the topsoil which is only about this deep it's this you know tan sort of clay kind of stuff it's almost like what we had in texas caliche except it's tan very hard to dig through and in frozen weather i had put some into a wheelbarrow and later when i came to get it out of the wheelbarrow i couldn't chop it with the shovel clunk, clunk, clunk. it wouldn't break it was like a solid rock that's what i was digging through this last week and so with another man's help we, uh, we got that line underground inside a conduit and back up into the garage where it had gone before. And I was so, so very happy. And I covered it all up. And I'd had all my freezers that are in the, in the garage. They were all hooked up to an extension cord that I had run from inside the house out a window down across the ground and under the snow back when we had snow and all the way over to the garage. And then one of these multi-strips and I plugged in all three freezers to it. So I thought, this is great. And I unplugged the first freezer and plugged it into the wall socket. And it didn't work. I thought, oh, no. And I checked a bunch of other sockets, and they didn't work. And I thought, oh, I remember there's a GFI here, one of those ground fault interrupters. And so I went over, and sure enough, it was not on. So I pushed it on, and it worked. Praise the Lord. I plugged everything in. But you know, I, I, I had for a moment there this awful feeling that 
I'm going to have to dig that thing up again. <laughs> Praise God, I didn't have to. But then I thought, but half the circuits aren't working in here. So um, the circuit breaker wasn't, broke, wasn't off down in the basement. And I thought to myself, I'm going to trace that other circuit, see if I have a short someplace. So inside the garage, I traced back and traced back. And I discovered something that I had never known before. Now, I know some of you are saying, what, there was something you didn't know? Yes, there's lots of stuff I don't know. I discovered there was a second GFI. I couldn't believe it. I've lived in the parsonage or in the manse for 10 years, and I never knew that that second line had a GFI on it. And I discovered it hidden behind stuff. I pushed it, and all the circuits worked. Now, you know, Fear causes discouragement. I was afraid that I was going to have to dig that up again. And I tell you, folks, that's discouraging because that took us about 10 hours to lay that conduit, thread the wire, very difficult to thread through conduit, and get it up underneath the porch. Discouragement. When you're afraid, it causes discouragement. Well, I left out one thing. In between there, I set up a flare prayer. I said, Lord, I'm turning to you. I don't have wisdom. I don't know how to do this. What is wrong? Please show me what is wrong. And God showed me what was wrong. You say, ah, well, you probably would have found it anyway. No, I would have been discouraged and have gone inside the house and probably gone to bed and thought, oh, brother, I don't want to mess with that now. It's getting dark and it's getting late and all that kind of stuff. People, God has given you victory over fear. And because God has given you victory over fear, God has given you victory over discouragement. Let me look at a couple others here for. This is Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 3. And shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach this day unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint. Fear not. Do not tremble. Neither be ye terrified because of them. What kind of enemies do you face? You face the world. You face the flesh. You face the devil. You face the demons. You say, boy, those are pretty big enemies. And they gang up on me. So I'm just going to sort of sit quietly, not let anybody know that I'm a Christian. So if they ever put me on trial for being a Christian, they won't have enough evidence to convict me. <laughs> you don't need to be afraid of your enemies. Neither be ye terrified at them. Instead, chapter 31, 11 chapters later, be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that do, doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. How many of you here think God ever failed you? I don't want to raise my hand, but raise your hand if you think God failed you. God failed me. He didn't do what he promised to do. Well, he may not have done what you wanted him to do, but did he ever fail you by doing something that he said he wouldn't do or failing to do something he said he would do? Did he ever fail you by violating his own promises and his own word? Did he ever fail you? We need to remember that when we're put to the test. Israel gets put to the test over and over and over and over again. God said, I'm going to provide for you. He said, I've delivered you from Egypt. The passing of the Lamb blood has been shed. I have parted the waters of the sea for you. I have destroyed the Egyptian army for you. Do you not get it? He promised he would never fail them. And they still rebelled. The same thing happens with us as believers in the church. He has promised... I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Therefore, says the author of Hebrews, I will not fear what man can do unto me. That is taken directly out of the promises of the Old Testament. I've been reading them to you. Be strong of your good courage. Be, fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Chapter, verse 8. And the Lord, he, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee. Neither forsake thee. Fear not. Neither be dismayed. Do you get the point? Israel was scared. 
Five times in one verse they have to be told, don't be afraid. Joshua chapter 8, verse 1, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee, and arise, go up to Ai. See, I have given unto the hand the king of Ai and his people and his city and his land. Joshua 10, 25, Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of a good courage, for thus shall the Lord do all your enemies against whom ye fight. The scripture gives us a command not to fear. Now, it's not just a matter of, well, I was scared. You know, I didn't quite trust God. Because it is a command in Scripture not to be afraid. It's a command. When you are afraid, you are disobeying a command of Scripture. It's not, oh, I just made a mistake. I just sort of got scared. When you fear, instead of immediately Setting up a flare prayer, Lord, give me strength, help me to move forward, you've told me to do this. When you tremble and run, you disobey a command of Scripture. If the commanding general tells the troops, move forward, and one of them gets weak knees and goes AWOL, do they say to him, oh well, you know, we know you're a little bit scared. We'll give you some psychological counseling and, and then we'll give you a desk job. What happens to him in the middle of war? He has disobeyed the order to go forward and in spite of his fear, he walks into the teeth of death. And if it were not so, you and I would not be sitting here today in freedom. You see, it's not just a matter of his own personal safety and his own personal fears. His decision affects, in those cases, thousands of other people. It affects first that small group in his platoon, and then it affects his company, and then it affects his army. You've heard the old saying, for want of a nail, a shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, a horse was lost. For want of a horse, a rider was lost. For want of a rider, a battle was lost. For want of a battle, the war was lost. For want of a nail, the war was lost. Dear people, it's not an option. Be strong and of a good courage. Have not I commanded thee, be not dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Joshua 1, 8 and 9. How about Judges 6, 23? And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Gideon. Second Kings, a hero of faith, I would remind you. Second Kings 6, 16. And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Here's Elijah, the city of Samaria, surrounded oh, by the enemy forces, and they're coming to get him. And then God opens the eyes of the young man, and he sees that the mountains around them are filled with horses and chariots of fire. That's the Shekinah. And he surrounds you too, because you are his precious treasure. Fear not, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Fear not. Oh, people, I have to come back to this all the time because there are a lot of scary things out there, and for preachers especially, there are a lot of scary things out there. How about First Chronicles 28, 20? And David said to Solomon his son, Be strong and of good courage and do it. Fear not. Nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, even thy, my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee, until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. Solomon said, man, I'm, I'm young. <laughs> what the, how in the world am I ever going to do this? David had wanted to build the temple. God said to him, do Nathan the prophet, he said, first, yep, go right ahead, good idea. And then God spoke to Nathan and said, you go back and tell him he's not going to do it because he's a man of war. 
I'll let his son do it. And now David says to Solomon, you know, I didn't have the, the privilege. I wanted to do this. I really, really wanted to do this. David was a man after God's own heart. He loved God. He worshiped God. He wanted to build the temple. But God said, because you're a man of war, I'm going to let your son Shlomo, which means peace. He's not a war. He's a man of peace. I'll let him build the temple. And so David encourages him. Don't be afraid. Do it. Did you know that faith does it? It doesn't just talk about it. It doesn't just think about it. It doesn't write out elaborate plans and hope somebody else will do it. Faith does it. Fear doesn't do it because it's afraid something might happen that's bad. David encourages Solomon, be strong and of good courage and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed. For the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee until thou hast finished. He's going to let you live long enough to finish the work for the service of the house of the Lord. You think, man, I'm getting older. I might die. Okay, what has God given you to do? Then instead of sitting on your hands, instead of puttering around, do it. God will let you live long enough to finish whatever he wants you to accomplish if you get off your hands and do it. Fear will keep you from doing it. The devil doesn't want you to do what God wants you to do. The devil doesn't want you to fulfill God's plans. The devil wants you to sit on your hands. The devil wants you to think about it. The devil will be very pious and say, well, you should pray about it for a while. Look, if you know it's God's will, you do it. You do it. Quit procrastinating. If God has made his will clear through his word, if he has convicted your heart and mind by the power of his Holy Spirit, if you understand the path God wants you to take and you see there are enemies in the path, you do it. Because he's promised never to leave you, never to forsake you, never to give up on you, never to uh, deny you what is necessary to fulfill his will. And he's sovereign. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 17. Jehoshaphat, standing at the battle and says, Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. And God causes the armies of the enemy to kill each other. God will be with you. How about Isaiah 35.4? Say unto them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with a vengeance, even God with a recompense. He will come and save you. Pretty good promise. How about Isaiah 41.13? For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. How about verse 14? Fear not, thou worm Jacob, and ye men of Israel. I will help thee, saith the Lord, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Look, how big is God? Is there anything in this world that can stand against him if he is with you? If God be for us, who can be against us? That's true today, just as well as 2,000, 4,000 years ago. But now saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, and it's not just sort of general. Listen to the next phrase. I have called thee by name. God didn't just sort of look out there and say, oh well, we'll throw a bucket of salvation and we hope it hits somebody. I have called thee by name. It's not... A bunch of people were written in the Lamb's Book of Life. It talks about the names, individuals who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Is your name there? Do you know for sure? Is your name there. 
if your name is there, you do not need to be afraid. He says, fear not, for I have called thee by name. If it's not there, if the Spirit of God has spoken to your heart this day, through his word, not because of this preacher, but the word of God, the Bible tells you that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You must believe and trust Jesus, who alone can save you. And then he gives you eternal life that lasts forever. He doesn't take it back. He gives you eternal life. And Jesus said, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand, the Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. What have you done with Jesus? If you've trusted him, fear not. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. How Satan uses fear, timidity, wishy-washiness, or compromise, which is normally based on some form of fear, to defeat us, to keep us from walking by faith, to ruin our Christian life, to intimidate us. Oh, how he loves intimidation, trying to scare us. But you have promised that you will never leave us nor forsake us, so that we may boldly say, I will not fear what man shall do unto me, because the Lord is my helper. What an incredible promise from your word. Father, we pray that you'll take your word and apply it to our hearts and use it in the way that most perfectly glorifies your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. Let's take our hymn, hymnals and turn to number 413, Break Thou the Bread of Life. We'll be singing the first and last verses of the hymn, the first and fourth.